It's the wedding night of near-mythical warrior king Attila the Hun, arch-enemy of the Roman Empire. His new bride is Ildico, said by Roman chroniclers to be a great beauty. To celebrate, Attila feasts deep into the night, sharing toasts with his fellow Huns before retiring to bed. But the next morning, Attila does not emerge. When his anxious bodyguards burst in, they find his lifeless body and blood on the sheets. Who or what could have killed the most feared man on earth? Attila's tribe, the Huns, arrived in Europe around three decades before Attila's birth. They came from the east and settled on the great Hungarian plain, just beyond the reach of the Roman Empire. I want to find out more about the Huns and their enemies. To help me on my quest, I've enlisted archaeologist Professor Barry Cunliffe. Barry, Joe. Hello, Joe. Hello. Hello. Nice, nice to meet see you. you. So just what happened when the Huns hit these plains 1,600 years ago? The Huns established themselves as the bosses of, of a whole range of different people. And um, they make sure that these people are kept subservient. So... How is that possible? What is it about the Huns that made them so fearsome? I think it really boils down to the man-horse relationship. If you can imagine the power of one horse, imagine a thousand or, or 1,500 out there just coming towards you. A perfectly tuned engine uh, that is just bent on your destruction. The Huns used their unmatched horsemanship and archery to create a vast empire. Then in 434 AD, Attila succeeded to the Hunnic throne. Attila comes in at that point when the whole Hunnic body is working as one and he is the big man who is able to control the lot. Just how powerful a leader was he? For 20 years or so, he was probably the dominant character in the whole of Europe. As the Huns grew ever more powerful, the Romans were in decline. Their empire was now split in two, with the wealth centered around Constantinople to the east. It was a prime target for King Attila. He was organizing a protection racket, really. He was threatening particularly Constantinople. And if the Romans didn't pay him what he asked, he would simply attack. Attila was a constant threat and a massive drain on Roman resources, costing their treasury over 10 tons of gold in payoffs. Much of this gold was melted down for Hunnic jewellery. But today the Hungarian National Museum hold coins which make the Roman source clear. Wow, so look at these. So these are the proof, the evidence of the fear and the respect that Attila instilled in the mighty Roman Empire. This uh, coin hoard was found uh, in Sikanj. It's in the Great Plain in Hungary. Right and the total number was around 2,000 coins in one hoard. And we you know uh, it was minted under the rule of Theodosius II. So this definitely dates it to the time definitely of Attila? Dates, yes, to the time of Attila. And this would have been, what do you call it, a tribute, a ransom? We pay you now so you don't attack later? It was uh, called a tribute. a tribute. And this was an attempt to keep them away from Constantinople, to keep them away from the, from the Roman Empire. Amazing. The once mighty Roman Empire was paying golden tribute to a barbarian king. Could there have been any greater motivation to kill 
Attila the Hun. As Joe's learned, the Romans must have desperately wanted Attila dead. But one person had a far greater opportunity to kill the king on his wedding night. His bride. So I think the finger of suspicion must first of all point at Ildico. She was the last to see him alive and the first to be found with his dead body. But what evidence links her to his death? To find out, I've come to one of Europe's oldest libraries, the Bodleian. A treasure trove of texts from the ancient world. Here, historian Dr. Megan McAvoy showed me a 1,500-year-old document that points the finger squarely at Ildico. This is actually the chronicle of a man we know as Marcellinus Comes. It's written about 80 years after Attila's death. So what's it say? Well, it says that Attila, the king of the Huns and the ravager of Europe, was killed on his wedding night by a knife wielded by his wife. Aha, so this is it. This is case closed. It was her. Well, it's not as straightforward as that. You know, this was a source written 80 years after the events. We're not at all sure what Marcellinus' sources are. He's writing in Constantinople, a long way away from um, the events. So he's separated by time and place, and maybe therefore not very reliable as a source. Potentially. I mean, in fact, he even gets the year of Attila's death wrong. Well, that's not a good sign, is it? It's not really. The case against Ildico seems fatally flawed. But the Bodleian does hold another document describing Attila's death. A copy of a work written by a Roman historian named Priscus. Priscus is singularly well informed about the Huns. He has been on an embassy himself to Attila. So he actually met Attila? He has met him. Uh, he can give us the only eyewitness account we have of Attila. This meeting came four years before Attila's ill-fated wedding. Priscus was hundreds of miles away when Attila died, but news still appears to have reached him of how the king met his end. On the actual night of the wedding, he gives himself over greatly, we're told, to wine and to merriment. At the end of the evening, we're told that he lies down on his back, sodden with drunkenness, and he actually has a hemorrhage. According to Priscus, it wasn't the Romans who caused Attila's sudden death, but booze. He simply got a nosebleed and was too drunk to wake up. Nearly 1,600 years ago, this city was known as Constantinople. It was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire and the place where Priscus penned his tale of Attila's death. Now the fact that Priscus wrote of Attila's death right here in this great city, over a thousand kilometers from the action, well, of course, that should make us cautious. But one historian goes even further. He says that Priscus's account that Attila died of natural causes after heavy drinking was deliberately false. In fact, he says it was part of a massive cover-up. To hear about the conspiracy in Constantinople, I'm heading to the old part of town. I've been invited there for a drink by historian Dr. Michael Babcock. Michael, good to see you. How are you? Good to see you too. Joe. So, Michael, what's with the red wine? It seems slightly ironic to sit here and talk about Attila the Hun with the very drink that probably killed him. Well, many people did toast his death when he died, but uh, the wine is something that takes us right back, as close as we can get to the night he died. He died, we are told, on his wedding night, and that was the occasion of a great feast, and there was drinking at that feast. But what Priscus, the eyewitness historian, tells us in an earlier visit when he was there is that Attila drank relatively little. He was a man who was very much in charge of himself, in control of himself, and drinking was not very high on the, on the list of his occupations. So where does this story of the barbarian dying a drunken death come from then? Well, we're right here in the old city of Constantinople, and that's where the story would have originated. Today, the skyline of Istanbul is punctured by mosques. 
But in the 5th century, this was a Christian city. Attila's drunken death fitted their idea of how a heathen should die. The picture of him as a drunken glutton came from the pulpits of the churches of this city. So this is Christian Roman PR spin in action. Oh, exactly right. It was part of the political and religious propaganda that, that emanated from the church and from the palace of this city. If you're concerned that this drunken death really doesn't add up, what do you think happened? Well, I think Attila was murdered. And I think that was a plot that was hatched once again right here in Constantinople. According to Michael, the murder was motivated by fear. And Attila clearly terrified the people here. These great city walls were specifically built to keep out the Huns. But building walls is one thing. Killing the leader of a superpower, quite another. So how would it actually work? How would they assassinate Attila the Hun hundreds of miles from here? Today, if you want to kill your enemy in the home camp, what you do is you send out a, a laser-guided missile. And, and, and that's how you do it. But, but back then, ambassadors who traveled from court to court were as good as a laser-guided missile. Attila's ambassadors often visited the court in Constantinople. Michael thinks they were bribed to go back and murder their leader. It seems to be agreed there was no wound upon the body. So what happened to kill Attila the Hun? The most likely thing that would have happened would have been poisoning, certainly. He wasn't himself a drinker, but there were ceremonial toasts that he would have sipped. And certainly he could have been poisoned on that night. So could it be that Attila didn't die of drunkenness, but was taken out by a 5th century drone, fired from Constantinople. The assassination theory is intriguing, but is it the likeliest cause of death? To try and answer that question, I'm meeting forensic pathologist, Dr. Stuart Hamilton. Good to see you again. Hello. It's his job to determine what causes sudden deaths. So what would he make of finding Attila the Hun on his mortuary slab? Okay, so Attila here, he was found with blood coming from his nose and down his throat. Does that suggest to you that he could have been murdered? If there's no other signs of trauma, it doesn't really sound like a typical murder, but I suppose you can't exclude poisoning. But in those sort of situations, you'd really expect to see more generalised bleeding rather than just sort of one focal area. If poisoning doesn't fit the evidence, what about alcohol? As a forensic pathologist, context is key. What we've got is Attila, who, as I understand, was maybe 50 in his 50s, it's his wedding night, and he's had quite a bit to drink. On a wedding night, I think we can assume that he's maybe exerted himself a little more than normal. That puts your blood pressure up, it puts your pulse up, and that sort of thing can cause a nosebleed. But if you're dead drunk and you've lost your gag reflex, blood runs down the back of your throat, into your airways, blocks them, you asphyxiate. The simplest explanation for a pathologist is often the most likely. So you're telling me that what killed Attila was sex? More by sex and alcohol. The simplest forensic solution fits our best historical record. Both suggest Attila, the most feared warrior on earth, was killed not by the Romans, but by a killer combination of wine and overexertion on his wedding night. It seems to me that we want the great exciting figures from the past to have died great exciting deaths. Yet these mythical figures were real, and they died in real, if sometimes embarrassing ways. <laughs> 